Hello to our audience and to our lovely speakers. A very, very warm welcome on what is quite a frosty evening in Brussels to the first of two virtual events that are organized by Carbon Connects. This is an EU funded uh, Interreg Northwest Europe project. Now, very importantly at the outset, can I ask you to check that you are listening in the language of your choice because we do have interpretation in English, French, Dutch and German. So that's very important. Now, given the relative lateness of the hour for a virtual event, I really do hope that you've got something nice in hand, a cup of tea, uh, a mug of hot chocolate, maybe a brandy, maybe a glass of wine, who knows even a dessert. I've got to let you know that I faced down both my dinner and wine because I didn't want to kind of feel too full or too piddled before this event. Now, my name is Katrina Sickle. I'm a broadcaster and a presenter, and I've had the pleasure of moderating on all sorts of topics to do with agriculture and rural development. And this one and its sister event on the 21st of December in Butter Week promises to be highly interesting, highly informative and highly relevant. Now, what's the backdrop? To the next 90 minutes? Well, for those who are a little less familiar with the details, Carbon Connects is a project that gathers partners from six countries, from the UK, from Ireland, from Germany, from France, from Belgium, and from the Netherlands under the overall partner leadership of a university in the Netherlands, Van Hall Larenstein University of Applied Science. What's the aim of this fantastic project? Well, it has really diverse pilot schemes and the overall aim is to reduce the high carbon footprint of peatland soils in Northwest Europe by essentially introducing new bio-based business models that are developed for sustainable land management practices. Now, peatland restoration can seriously contribute to the world's journey to net zero carbon emissions. When they are healthy, they can act as incredible carbon stores and potential carbon sinks, but if they are allowed to degrade, they can threaten biodiversity, they release pollutants into the environment and also impact negatively on climate change mitigation and adaptation goals. Now, I'm not gonna to say too much more because that's actually in the hands of the fabulous speakers who are gonna address you this evening, but I would like to share one sobering statistic uh, something I learned when I learned all about this fascinating topic. The EU is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions from drained peatlands. So that is 15% of global peatland emissions. And draining peatlands does occur in almost all member states. And then it tends to contribute more than 25% of those member states' total emissions from agriculture and land use. So very, very, very compelling. And indeed, the first ever peatland pavilion took place at COP26, and its virtual hub still remains as a legacy. Thankfully, there is a way to solve drainage problems, to maintain the land, to protect biodiversity, to contribute to mitigating climate change, and most importantly, to protecting the livelihoods of all of those working on the land. So that's a little bit of the preamble. I'm just checking that I'm not getting anything. I can see, il y a une double traduction français. I can see there seems to be double interpretation in French there, but I'm hoping that could get fixed. There's a message for the lovely Christophe and Samuel. If you're reading that, I think there might be something that needs to be fixed there. So as I was saying to all of you good people tuning in, the diverse speakers and experts and farmers from all sorts of communities that you're gonna hear from this evening are gonna take you on a really interesting journey that is gonna explore how the key to maintaining sustainable farming and peatlands lies in carbon. And what they're gonna do for you is unpack the challenges, solutions, the opportunities that are available, plus the targeted technical and financial support, including a fantastic toolbox that comes under developed under this project so there's a lot to get through essentially our speakers are going to address you via video they prepared their conversations very very diverse presentations very practical very to the point so do stay with us and then at the end we've got a live q a with most of those speakers so once you've heard a presentation if you have a question for that speaker keep it short put it in the q a super super short and I will pose that question hopefully to the speakers in that live session in the last 15 minutes of our event. So that's that. The other thing, of course, you can do is to uh, make your voice heard at any time on Twitter, hashtag Pete Land 
matters. OK, so I hope that's clear for all of you. Just before I hand over to the first speaker, I'd like to know where you come from. Now, I think when you were registering, you were asked if you could actually pin your location. And I do believe that we can re-put, uh, there should be a link in the chat for a Padlet, and that enables you to put in your location. There you go, Sustainable Farming for Peatlands. Where are you joining us from? So quite diverse, certainly, of course, from the countries that make up part of this fantastic project and where there are different demos and pilots. And we're going to hear about a lot of them this evening. So let's just give you a moment to see if there's anything that can be added here. I'm going to give it a couple of seconds, but not I'm just checking my uh, my watch there. OK, so we'll find out perhaps at the end and the lovely uh, technical crew behind the scenes can give me some information on where the majority of people are coming from. And also, by the way, really stay tuned because we've got a few questions for you. It's really important to know whether the event works for you. We think it will. So I've got a few questions right, right at the end. Ah, we're seeing a little bit of movement. We've got Galway. What else have we got? We've got up there towards the north, we've got further south in the UK, we've got the Netherlands, got uh, Brussels, we've got Belgium, where else have we got? We've got up there in uh, Germany, so we've got quite, quite a good mix, and again closer to between Stuttgart and Munich, so we've got, there it is, it's now come in the, uh, in the chat channel. Can you complete the Padlet? I'm going to hang on for one more minute. Oh, we've got Limerick in Ireland. There we go. Somebody's near Leipzig or in Leipzig. Ah, right near Nantes. That doesn't surprise me because of a project there. So uh, um, that makes absolute sense. Glad that those people are joining. I'm just going to move my chat because it's in the way of the Padlet. There we go again up north in, uh, in Scotland. We're going further up uh, in the UK. There we go, more and more we're seeing in the Netherlands. Fantastic, thank you everybody. I can't see you, but I'm really glad that you're alive and awake this evening and taking part in this. So there we go, lots, lots more. Thank you so much. Brilliant, well, you can keep adding that. That's great, because that's really helpful information. There you go, there's a lot going on in France there. Uh, there's also a lot going on in the Netherlands and then we've got oh we've got another one also from the UK there we are somebody who's not between Berlin and uh, near Hanover near Hamburg fabulous all right so I'm going to leave it right there really good to see the geographical uh, breadth of all of you who are sharing the virtual space with us now I'd like to get back to the here and now and to the content and get stuck in with the first of our expert speakers. Now, don't forget that he is sending a pre-recorded message. It's a really nice one, but he will be live in the Q&A session at the end of this event. His name is Jasper van Bell from Van Hall Laurenstein University of Applied Science. He teaches ecology, he works on research projects on sustainable use of peatlands and really focuses on ecosystem services delivered by healthy peatlands and crucially how to make them available for payment because that is certainly what's interesting for you he's going to start with the big picture he's going to say why peatlands are so important and of course some of the challenges in their restoration so if the lovely technical crew is ready i can ask if you can show the video thank you very much good night I am Jasper van Bella with Van Hal Lagenstein University of Applied Sciences and in this talk I will explain why peat farmers are vital to reach society's greenhouse gas reduction targets. First of all, why peatlands? Well, peatlands are, are um, ecosystems that in their natural state accumulate organic matter. And this is actually what peat is, accumulated, partially decomposed, but not fully decomposed uh, organic matter. And um, um, in or, um, uh, accumulating these, these, this organic matter, peatlands have over the past millennia 
stored a huge amount of carbon in their soils. And um, uh, actually, peatlands are the most efficient carbon store that we have on this planet. Peatlands cover just 3% of the world's land surface, yet they hold some 30% of the total carbon in the soils. Um, actually, the amount of carbon stored in peatlands is twice as much as that in all the, uh, the world's forests combined. And those forests cover a lot more ground. As I said, the peat is basically uh, uh, only partially decomposed biomass. And this is also how you can re recognize that you're on peat soils. Peat soils are typically organic soils made up of, of, of layers of partially decomposed plant remains. And if they're wet enough, you can actually see, as the round pictures on the, on the lower left show, you can actually see uh, parts of plants still in there. These pictures show seeds and rhizomes and rootlets, which are still recognizable in peat layers. Functioning peatlands, through um, uh, accruing all this, this biomass, actually are a carbon store. They take up CO2 from the air, which is transformed to, to plant biomass, and then gets added to the soil layers where it stays. Um, this makes peatlands a natural carbon sink. However, there still is some carbon emission, which leaves these systems in the form of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. When you drain peatlands, they become from the they, they change from from a, a balanced system which which uh, um, uh, locks carbon in the soil but in in terms of global warming potential is about neutral they change into to um, uh, quite potent sources of of greenhouse gases and this is because all the plant remains that were make making up the soil are now being decomposed and are emitted to the soil as CO2. Actually, the total amount of CO2 being emitted from the world's drained peatlands is twice as much as that is emitted from the global aviation um, industry. And it's about 10% of all the annual fossil fuel emissions. So that's substantial. Greenhouse gas emissions from peat have a clear relationship with groundwater levels, as these pictures on the left show you. On the horizontal axis, they show the mean annual groundwater level. So minus 50 means that the groundwater level averaged across the year is 50 centimeters below the surface, zero being the surface. The vertical axes show the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of CO2 equivalents. If you look at the top figure, you see that the, the solid line shows the relationship between CO2 uh, emissions and groundwater levels, and you see that the uh, CO2 emission decreases as groundwater levels go nearer the surface. And actually, once the groundwater levels um, reach above the surface, you get carbon uh, dioxide CO2 fixation, so it gets locked in the soil. However, the dashed line shows what happens with methane, and methane um, uh, starts being produced and being emitted um, from about 40 to 30 centimeter below the surface and then as groundwater levels rate, uh, rise even even closer nearer the surface the uh, emission of methane increases and methane is a potent greenhouse gas the third gas that you need it to take into account when you think about greenhouse gas emissions from peat is that of nitrous oxide uh, but nitrous oxide does not have a clear relationship with, with groundwater levels. Rather, it is related to fertilizer application and history. So for the, the carbon emissions, CO2 and methane, 
we see that there is a trade-off in, in the total uh, net green, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, between reducing CO2 emissions and at some point increasing methane emissions. And this leads to a sweet spot, a minimum emission at about 10 to 20 centimeters below the surface. If you look at, at the, the, the parcel scale, um, you can see the effect drainage has on these emissions in these graphs. These are calculations done with our Carbon Connect site emission tool. Um, uh, on the left is shown a typical drained grassland and it's fertilized as well. You see the total um, greenhouse gas emission from this piece of land for just one hectare is about 35 tons CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. If you would change this to a very wet grassland with typically with four species in there, um, uh, you would have a net emission of about six tons CO2 equivalents per hectare per year, which is actually made up of methane instead of CO2. The CO2 is actually below surface that the light green uh, showing that it's that CO2 is being sequestered in the soil. Also, the N2O emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions are reduced because we shift from a fertilized system to a non-fertilized system. So the difference is roughly about 30 tons CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. And this amounts to some 135,000 car kilometers or the, the annual car kilometer budget for, let's say, four to five uh, uh, households. And if you if you transfer for this, this CO2 emission from the soil to the milk production, you can calculate that, that, that one glass of milk from dairy, from peatlands, uh, equates to burning two glasses of gasoline in terms of, of, of global warming potential, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is quite substantial. So what can we do about this? This is, of course, the million dollar question. Theoretically, the, the, the solution is, is, well, relatively simple. You raise the groundwater levels and you get decreased uh, greenhouse gas emissions. However, you still need to also make a living from this land, and this is where it becomes difficult. Here are some options of, of alternative wet crops uh, that can be grown. Top left shows taifa, uh, an experimental taifa field. The taifa from this field is, is harvested in winter, chopped to small pieces. And then as the guy with the, uh, 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 in, the, in the top right shows, um, can be used as blow-in insulation for building houses. And this works. Um, uh, other options are, are to grow sphagnum, uh, shown in, a, in the bottom left. Um, to be used as, as high quality substrate uh, for, for horticultural uh, uh, applications, or you can, can have cattle, wet adapted cattle like these buffaloes, or you can have uh, cranberry growing and then and produce cranberry juices and jams and, and, and all that. Furthermore, as you actually raise these groundwater levels, you reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions and you can, can get paid for that. So that's, that's one of the ecosystem services of raising groundwater levels uh, in agricultural fields. And, and um, payment for ecosystem services can be claimed, uh, for instance, in the, in the form of carbon credits. So sell your reduced emissions, your avoided emissions to another party wanting to reduce their carbon footprint. This graph shows um, uh, the balance between different ecosystem services uh, for different types of, of farming. On the, on the, on the far left is, is the um, traditional drain dairy system, and it goes all the way to the right to the, the, the typical polluticulture systems with reed or sphagnum growing. And we see that the total um, ecosystem services even transformed to euro values for the for the uh, polluticulture systems are, are higher than for the, for the traditional systems. But of course, um, there is an issue with this, and this is that the, the, the revenue from the biomass being produced 
is lower for these wet agriculture systems than for the traditional systems. So this is why we need to add the gray bars, the, 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 the payment for reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And there are some good news. There are opportunities for the future. Um, we are shifting to a bio-based economy and this will increase the demand for the biomass being produced in these types of systems. Also, greenhouse gas reduction um, um, is becoming more and more of an issue and as a result, carbon credits uh, or prices for carbon credits are on the rise. So these are our favorable uh, conditions for developing, further developing these, these, these wet crop systems. But of course there are constraints and, and the, uh, the, the most important being that, that these, these wet crop markets are still not yet fully developed. Um, I think other, other talks in this, this session will, will touch upon this. Um, we need to develop these further. And also payment for ecosystem services is still in development, but it looks like the new common agricultural uh, uh, policy from the EU will, will, will help uh, in developing these payment for ecosystem services. So there are chances here. Well, this was my talk. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much to Jasper there. And as I said, when I sort of sounded completely hyperactive and I said when I was listening to all this and doing the prep, I was absolutely staggered at the statistics. Well, first of all, OK, that peatlands, the most efficient carbon store on the planet, if managed well and not mismanaged, covering three percent of the world land area and storing two times as much as in the world's forests. Um, absolutely staggering, very compelling statistics. I just want to uh, let you know that if slides weren't clear, and if you want to hear anything again, you will be able to access this event on the Carbon Connects YouTube channel in a couple of days. So please, no stress about that. Very interesting when he talked there, of course, about the critical issue of how you make a living from farmland. And there was a little bit of talk there about the various ways, the incentives, but you're going to hear more and in more detail about that from other speakers in uh, and at our event. But I think the critical other point that I heard there is draining peatlands changes them from a balanced system. I think I'm quoting Jasper here from a balanced system into a potent source of greenhouse gas emissions. So an awful lot there, hugely comprehensive. And also let me just uh, flag up again on the Carbon Connects website, you can of course have a look at and test out that site emissions tool. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. And I know that other speakers will also talk more about that. Right, Jasper will be joining us at quarter past nine Central Eastern time. Now, if you have a question, stick it, keep it short in the Q&A. Who have we got next? Yes, I just saw that. Ami Tillak from the Limerick Institute of Technology. He is working as a project officer in the Technological University of Shannon, Midlands and Midwest, on the EU Carbon Connects Peatland Project. Helpfully, he specialises in hydrology and water quality of peatlands, wetlands and riparian buffers and has worked all over the world. So he brings a wealth of experience to the table. He's now going to in, uh, share with us some insights into the restoration of a degraded bog in West Galway. So let's have a listen now, if we can launch the video. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking time for attending this uh, Carbon Connects project webinar. I am Dr. Ame Estulak. I work as an Irish partner in Technological University of Shannon with the Carbon Connects Peatland Project. Today, I'm going to talk about the Irish pilot site and the activities we do at the Irish pilot site. So we are the European Union Carbon Connects Peatland Project focused on the Northwestern region of the Europe. There are several EU partners in this project. We have Ireland, we have UK, we have France, we have Belgium, and we have Netherlands who are the lead partners of this project. Uh, each EU partner, as you can see from the map, uh, we have a pilot peatland project to demonstrate our activities. So we have an Octorard pilot site in Ireland, we have Valence Lodge in the UK, there are several peatland sites, pilot sites in Netherlands, two in Belgium, and now two in France. That's a project website if you want to go and have a look at it in detail. 
So at all these pilot sites, uh, we have a common goal to enhance the carbon sequestration of drained but later revetted peatlands in the Northwest Europe, promote business models, generate financial incentives for landowners and farmers, and host farmer to farmer sessions, exchange best ideas, practices with regards to revetting of peatlands, enhancing carbon sequestration, and uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the more detailed information on each pilot site can be obtained on the Common Connects uh, website. As I said, each EU country has its own unique peatland pilot site, own unique business model. Our Belgium partners are looking at growing reeds on peatlands and wetlands. The Irish partners are working with uh, another European innovation project, the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project, who are looking at the ecosystem services or the results-based payment scheme. Uh, we have the UK partners uh, revetting their bogs and looking at sphagnum inoculation on their, on their blanket bogs. We have French partners who have revetted the pilot site and they're looking at biodiversity aspect. We have the Netherlands partners, they have several sites, they're looking at the paleoriculture on the revetted peatlands. So coming back to Ireland, we are working with another European innovation project called as the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project. As you can see from the map of the Ireland, the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project, a European innovation project is directly working with farmers and landowners who are located, who have peatlands and located on the Western coast of the Ireland in several of the catchments shown in the red color. So uh, as the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project is directly working with farmers, they are incentivizing farmers and landowners having peatlands to not only revet their peatlands, to provide financial incentives for the revetted peatlands, but revetting the peatlands would enhance the quality of the peatland. So higher the quality of the vegetated, good vegetated peatland, higher is the payment score, as you can see from the payment graph um, shown on the, the top left. So essentially, this Paul Muscle Project scheme is a results-based payment scheme, directly working with farmers and landowners. So we are working with the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project in the Oban Rift River catchment and with a private landowner who is working with the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project. Uh, our site is located in a small town near the small town of Uktarad, near the bigger city of Galway. It's a nine hectare blanket peatland. It's a privately owned land. It's uh, the, the vegetation of the peatland is a mix of bare peat, uh, ling heather, and some sphagnum mosses. Uh, the site is located in Oban Rift River catchment. We are doing some environmental monitoring at the peatland site in two phases, pre and the post revetting. Pre revetting is before blocking the drains and revetting the pilot site, and post revetting is beyond blocking the drains and looking at uh, revetting uh, after monitoring after revetting of the pilot site. So we are looking at several environmental variables. We are looking at rainfall. You know, we are looking at water table data. We are collecting water table data every one hour. We are looking at some water chemistry in the peat and in the water, and in uh, the peat and the water. So on November 10th and 11th, uh, we block, we identified several uh, drain blocking points in collaboration with the private landowner and the Freshwater Pearl Muscle Project. And uh, the, the, the photo on the top left shows the drain blocking, you know, blocking drains and ditches uh, to raise the water table up to the peat surface. We want our peat land to be revetted, to be wet. Um, so we did drain blocking on the couple of days. And I think on November 13th and 14th, we had a good bit of rainfall after the drain blocking. So we could immediately see the effects of the drain blocking. And we are monitoring the drain blocking effects through the water table data. So uh, we have uh, uh, four wells at different spatial locations collecting water table data every hour. And uh, this is the average water table data. So the average water table data before drain blocking was seven centimeters below the peak surface. It varied to uh, around 20 centimeters in the summer. So in the 20 centimeters, it was 20. In the summer, I'm sorry, it was 20 centimeters below the top peak surface. and uh, after drain blocking, uh, the water table depth varied between somewhere at the peat surface to above the peat surface and within five centimeters from the top peat surface. So 
drain blocking definitely had raised the water tables closer to the peat surface, to the top peat surface. So let's see how the water table data are translated into the greenhouse gas emissions. We have this wonderful tool developed by VHL, the lead partners, which is called a site emissions tool. It quantifies greenhouse gas emissions based on the vegetation and the water table in the pre and the post revetting phase. It is a very simple user-friendly Excel kind of software where the user can look at different types of vegetation which would commonly occur um, in the peatland. So our results showed that the total global warming potential uh, before drain blocking was 179.2 and after drain blocking was 84. So just by blocking the drains, we reduced our net greenhouse gas emissions by 53%. That's a, that's a lot, I believe. So we have blocked the drains, uh, you know, uh, we have revetted our peatland. Now we want sphagnum to recolonize on our peatland. That's our goal. So we want the, that sphagnum is a key species of the peat, so of, of the peatland. And uh, for sphagnum to regrow on the revetted peatlands, there are certain hydrological or eco-hydrological thresholds. So for sphagnum to regrow it on the revetted peatlands, that happens when the eco-hydrological thresholds are generally less than minus 100 centimeter. What is that minus 100 centimeter and when does it occur? So uh, the thresholds of my, at thresholds of greater than minus 100 centimeter, sphagnum mosses you know, began to desiccate. This inhibits this this uh, inhibits their photosynthesis processes because the reason being that sphagnum mosses don't have roots like the trees to take the water table uh, to to pull the water table uh, from the deeper water table depths, and the thresholds of minus greater than minus hundred centimeter generally occur when the water table is uh, deeper uh, from the top peat surface. And even with the drain blocking, we will still have the fluctuations in the water table depths. And in the summer, it could happen that the water table depths are not close to the top peat surface. And there, uh, and that's when these thresholds could happen um, where uh, it's not that great for sphagnum mosses because they can't just, they don't just have the ability to pull the water from a deeper water table depth. So how can these thresholds be quantified? You know, look at my measuring site-specific peat hydrophysical properties and look at the precipitation period. And that's, uh, you know, we did that um, at two peatland sites, Cowboy and Po Laguna. We had the uh, site-specific peat hydrophysical properties. We looked at the four-year precipitation data, which, you know, was normal precipitation year versus a dry versus a normal and a dry. So our, our modeling results showed that Cowboy revetted peatland the thresholds of minus greater 100 centimeter, uh, threshold of 100 centimeter or more was not reached in the Scoaboy revetted peatland, which is what we want. We don't want the ecohydrological thresholds to be greater than 100 centimeters. And Scoaboy revetted peatland showed that these thresholds were not reached, which is great. At the Polaguna revetted site, we had 39 days in a dry period when the minus 100 centimeter threshold was exactly reached. Uh, we concluded that moss recolonization is likely to be successful on the revetted peatlands, having lower to no minus 100 centimeter threshold days. And we just recently published a paper on, uh, we have some more peatland sites, which we did the modeling. We just published the paper, so you can have a look at it later on. Uh, we are also working uh, uh, to publish, we have also published this peatland booklet, a collaboration of five European Union project is shares, cutting edge experiences, gaps, priorities, and lessons important for peatland practitioners. Um, so you can have a look at it on the website. These are my references and we acknowledge the Interreg Freshwater Pearl Muscle and the private landowner. And with this, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Warm thanks to Ame there for a fantastic presentation. I sort of feel it was maybe pointless saying that everybody pre-recorded because they have thus far presented in such a lively way that you would actually think that they are with us. But don't forget that Ame will also be joining that live Q&A session at the end. And there is a booklet, the Peatlands booklet. So either the link will go into the chat 
or you can contact, I mean, if you go on the Carbon Connects website, all of this uh, can be found, all of these fabulous materials. And as I said, there is an exclusive YouTube channel where you can catch even more videos than the ones that you are going to uh, watch at this event. Now I've seen two uh, questions come in. I'm going to ask our lovely speakers who will meet at the end to take a look at them so that you can explain in a little more detail what's been asked there. I do think that uh, a little bit partially uh, answers to those questions that have come in in, might be uh, might be answered in the uh, video presentations that are coming up. So what is coming up next? We're going to hear now directly from an Irish farmer who's involved in one of the projects on peatland restoration and good to have uh, some insights from him. So I'm going to invite our lovely technical team to please play the next video. Thank you. Uh, I am a farmer and also a landowner um, in the west of Ireland, um, about 30 kilometres west of uh, Galway City. The farm is made up of some, you know, Atlantic blanket bog, some West Heath, and let's just say, I think the, so the actual peatland would be approximately 100 hectares. On this farm, we do everything from breeding sheep to um, managing forestry, commercial forestry, um, turf cutting to heat domestic homes, um, blueberries, and uh, we also do Airbnb. My father who owned the farm since 1962, so for almost 60 years, improved the farm and made it economically viable by draining the farm. So, from a farm economics perspective, uh, rewetting and rehabilitation would destroy the economics of the farm, um, but would be great from an ecological perspective, would be great from a carbon sequestration perspective, would be great from a climate change and climate action perspective, but based on the current farming model, it would collapse if it was fully rewetted. If we are to try and improve the quality of our peatlands and start to reinstate our peatlands in a meaningful way, we will need to have some kind of performance-based payment. For example, um, perhaps um, a certain payment per ton of carbon sequestration achieved on the farm. Peatlands are an extremely um, valuable source of sequestration, have huge potential but this potential has not been realized because it does not make financial sense for landowners to consider this. At the moment, um, un unfortunately, if we you know, move in one direction, we damage nature. If we move in the other direction, we damage farm economics. We need something sustainable, something in the center. Farmers <clears throat> are very concerned about the biodiversity collapse. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. Um, we've got climate change, we, we see big changes in our farms, and we see big changes in weather patterns over the last couple of decades. And from the previous generation, we have um, grown some conifers on cutaway peatlands. We have um, harvested blueberries um, because of the pH on a small area of peatland, but I, I have not seen evidence Yes, I've heard a lot of you know theories and you know ideas about how politiculture and so on could be meant to implement on peatlands, but I have not seen anything that makes sustainable or economic sense, um, or at least I haven't seen the evidence to date. I would be very happy to see this, um, but I haven't seen it. That's why I think that carbon sequestration or ecological service payments for farmers are really important. We as farmers are basically custodians of the land. We get to manage it for our lifetimes. Um, we don't own the land. We're just here for a period of time, like the people came before us. So we have a responsibility to ensure we basically hand on our farms and land to the next generation in a better way than we received it 
and to constantly improving. I think what's uh, particularly interesting about that uh, testimonial there is, is, you know, the absolute clarity and honesty, you know, there's from the ecological point of view, see it makes sense from the carbon sequestration point of view, see it makes sense from the climate action point of view, but economically, according to the business model of his particular farm, he says, oh, it would collapse if we were just to do that, but I want to find out more because I understand that it really does work. I need more evidence. Now, a lot of work has been done, as you can see, from so many different perspectives in this project, not least on uh, seeing how uh, restoring peatlands really does make financial sense and some of the ways that it can be done. Now, our next two speakers are going to present the launch of a fabulous white paper on carbon and eco credits. That is the culmination of two years of very detailed, very evidence-based joint work from Carbon Connects and Care Peat Interreg Northwest East uh, 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 Northwest Europe. Sorry, projects. You're going to hear from Dr. Valentina Sehi, who is a soil specialist. Um, soil ecology, soil functionality, and she is working at the University of Applied Sciences, the leader, uh, Van Hall Larenstein, in this, uh, this six-country partner uh, project. You're also going to hear from Nial O'Brolicon, who is a researcher and lecturer. He's based at the Insight Centre for Data Analytics at the National University of Ireland in Galway. So this is absolutely splendid work, uh, two years in the making. We're going to have a listen to the top lines of their findings. Hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for joining our presentation today. I'm here together with my colleague, Neil, uh, to present our white paper on uh, eco-credit uh, scheme in Pitland. So it's, it's my pleasure today uh, to, um, to give uh, this presentation and the official launch of our white paper. But first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Valentina Seki, and I work for Van Larestein, University of Applied Science in the Netherlands. And I'm working um, in a, in a, and I'm involved in a European project called Carbon Connects um, uh, within the Interreg uh, Northwest Europe uh, program. And this white paper is a result of a collaboration with another uh, Interreg project called CARPIT, and um, in which Neil is involved. And I would like before to start to actually introduce Neil. So please, Neil, uh, can introduce yourself. Certainly. Thank you very much, Valentina. And it's been my great pleasure to work with you over what I think is nearly two years working on this paper on our two European projects. Um, I'm obviously working with Care Pete. Neil O'Brolicon is my name and I'm a researcher and lecturer in the National University of Ireland in Galway. And we've collaborated across, uh, I think, six different countries with this white paper. And, um, you know, we, 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 I think we've got a very good output from this. So then let's start this presentation with an overview of the content. So first of all, um, I would like to, to give an overview of what the white paper is and what the main objective are. And then I will go into uh, an over giving an overview of the carbon credit system that exists in the peatland context. And then uh, from there, uh, I will give my, uh, the words to Neil, my colleague, that will talk instead about additional incentive and um, the framework that we came up with uh, to actually um, support the wetting and restoration. Then we'll talk about farm income and subsidies in Europe and give some conclusion. So for, uh, from this, then let's, let's start with the inside of the presentation. So why this white paper? Well, first of all, we wanted to give a baseline document um, of the existing carbon credit schemes and other, other financial incentives that are available for farmers to actually um, receive uh, incentive for, um, for peatland wetting and restoration. And also um, giving a critical um, uh, overview of these uh, systems and also um, outline a framework that could support um, rewetting and peatland restoration. 
So let's start with carbon credit. What is a carbon credit? Well, carbon credit is a unit of measurement and it's actually um, correspond to one ton of carbon dioxide that is removed from the atmosphere. And what you can do with this carbon credit? Basically, a carbon credit enables farmer or landowner to uh, sell uh, credit, uh, carbon credit to buyers that are willing to offset greenhouse gas emissions. So to give you an example, I'm a farmer that I uh, want to implement more sustainable uh, agricultural practices and doing that I save and reduce uh, carbon emission. In that sense, then I'm uh, enabled to apply for, um, for getting a uh, carbon credit certification, which is when approved, I'm able then to sell it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a traveler that is willing to, uh, to travel by uh, plane, for example, uh, can um, then buy this carbon credit and then with the money that, um, that, 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 uh, that they pay for um, offsetting their greenhouse gas emission are actually uh, going to uh, sustain the practices of the farmer. So in this, in this way we create a positive circle in which the farmer can uh, get money to implement sustainable practices. So uh, in this context, um, there are different carbon credit system. And uh, the one that I want to talk to you uh, today, the, the one that are of more interest in the peatland context are the carbon credit system in the, uh, that are voluntary. The voluntary uh, system are basically um, a system that are based on voluntary action to reduce greenhouse gas emission and depends on um, on the project that, they, that you are doing. So depending on what you want to do, uh, and um, you can basically um, apply for um, different standards or different rules. And I'm going to explain this better in the following slide, giving you some example. So one of the most known uh, accreditation system that is internationally recognized is the VCS uh, system, which is a verified carbon standard. Um, that are usually um, applied to land use project and focuses on, uh, on greenhouse gas re uh, reduction. And uh, basically this system gives guidelines for uh, the de development also of peatland project and how you can, uh, following this uh, uh, criteria and these guidelines, you can then be able to get certified for carbon credits. Another well-known uh, voluntary uh, accreditation system is called Gold uh, Standard and is one of the most rigorous certification standards and is recognized internationally and supported by corporation, NGO and UN. Um, and also um, not, not only recognize um, the, the, benefit, the benefit, the environmental benefit of the carbon credit, but also this, the social value. Both these standards are really uh, good and um, well uh, recognized internationally, as I said. The only problem is that often are very expensive for a, for a landowner or a farmer to apply for this because, of course, when you apply, you need to prove what you're doing and to do so, you have to go through an accreditation system that sometimes is quite expensive. Um, so, in addition to this system, we also have identified others that are uh, specifically applied for in peatland context. And the first one that we identify is the more future. It's a, an example coming from Germany, um, from the Meyer Center. Uh, they, they develop their own uh, accreditation system, and it's the first one that, that um, issue uh, credit for peatland uh, rewetting. And um, basically, they can, you can uh, get certified for carbon credit, both if you reduce greenhouse gas emission, but also if you increase carbon sequestration. And um, these certificates are validated by academic experts. And if currently, uh, this, uh, this system is in place in three uh, German federal states. And they have uh, created, as I said, for the voluntary system, they created uh, uh, their own standard that is, on the other hand, strongly built on the VCS system. Another example comes from uh, from Netherlands and is called Valuta for Fein, that translated means money for peatland. And basically this uh, system aims to compensate farm for the cost they have 
to face for regretting their land. And this, um, this um, system is uh, certificated and validated by national authorities and is based on the water level. So rising the water level in their land allowed you to apply for uh, carbon credit. And the carbon credit can be purchase, purchased um, from uh, a national website called National CO2 Mart, so the market for CO2. Um, and the third and last example I want to present today is the Pitland Co that is com comes from U UK and um, is more focusing to on restoration more than rewetting and uh, for com uh, for uh, agricultural practices and Pitland Code basically set um, a series of best practices uh, requirement and uh, also a standard method for quantification of the greenhouse gas reduction also uh, is administrated by the IUCN, UK Pitland Program. And they are more, the, um, the benefits uh, for the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction are monitoring during the project. And the funding that you can, uh, that you are um, allowed to get depend from the, the damage of prior restoration, but also depend on the size and duration of the project. So, all these systems uh, have different criteria that um, that that uh, you need to uh, comply in order to be able to um, get carbon credit. One of the most important criteria in this method is the additionality. The additionality criteria means basically that you need to do something additional, additional, and something that would not uh, happen anyway. So in this case, if you look at this picture you have a very degraded land and then you want to uh, restore and rewet and then you end up in a better situation that you see on, on, my, on the right side of the screen. So in this case, additionality is made and then you are allowed to uh, apply for carbon credit. So in this, in this case, farmers can get incentive to restore. On the other hand, when farmers uh, are already uh, applying good practices, then they don't meet additionality. In this sense, then they are not allowed to, uh, to apply for carbon credit. In this sense, we arrive to a paradox. The paradox is the following. If I am uh, uh, if I'm doing good practices, then I cannot access to carbon credit system. On the other hand, if I'm, bad, I'm doing bad, uh, bad practices and I want to move to positive, then I'm allowed. So with this, uh, I would like to then give the words to Neil. Okay, we, we recognize as part of this white paper that, you know, there, there's a great opportunity for farmers here, particularly in relation to um, carbon credits and additional incentives um, on peatlands. And thankfully, the European Commission, um, with the, the vice president who's running the EU Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, has very much committed uh, the commission to um, protecting wetlands and peatlands and opening up new income sources for farmers via carbon farming and other, other methods. Um, so some of the things we looked at, additional incentives, obviously um, Valentina has very well described how carbon credits will work and indeed um, some of the, the key schemes which have looked at carbon credits and they're very well described in our white paper, which you're all very, um, we'd be very pleased if you could read it and look at it, it's a very good reference document. Um, so we looked at sort of water systems as potential, potentially, um, you know, a secondary source of income for um, people who are doing carbon farms. So additional ecosystem services from peatlands are not generally considered or accounted for in carbon credit schemes. So some effort in that direction has been uh, carried out by More Futures and by the Griveswold Meyer Centre um, with the, the More Futures scheme. Um, we looked at two sort of main options. One is incorporating ecosystem services into a carbon credit system and giving added value to that carbon, carbon credit system. And the second one is creating a separate payment system for ecosystem services. Now, we don't think the second one is that viable, but there may be some cases for it. But certainly um, we would see adding value to carbon credit schemes by having other e ecosystem services included is probably a very good idea. So we needed to develop a framework, um, you know, in relation to uh, the, you know, the 
sort of issuing of carbon credits, but also incorporating the ecosystem services. So in terms of the overall framework, we looked at national or regional greenhouse gas emissions framework and established a data bank of peatland types um, so that we have a methodology. Um, we suggested the guest methodology because that's the one that has been developed for the original um, More Futures scheme. Um, the, the actual site itself, you know, if we're going to go ahead, we need to select a site, establish baseline data for the site, um, monitoring and maintenance is very important. Uh, assess the value of the water services and restore peatland. Um, and then in terms of the carbon credits, obviously we need to do the assessment um, of greenhouse gas emissions. How many, how many tons of carbon are being emitted and so on. Establish duration. How long is the project going to last for? And in general, the, these projects would be 30 or 50 years. Um, calculate the total number of carbon credits involved. <clears throat> and then establish a price per carbon credit. Um, the, the sort of going price for peatlands is around uh, 70 euros at the moment, but we can only see that going upwards. So it's very important then to sell the carbon credits. But indeed, if we incorporate the other ecosystem services, such as water services, um, water retention, water purification, and so on, there's, about, there's a number of different types. Um, you know, we can add that value and sell it perhaps as eco credits rather than carbon credits specifically, but they would incorporate the carbon aspect of it. Um, so another thing we looked at was just farm income and subsidies as they stand. And we, we did this across six countries, including Germany, France, Ireland, uh, Belgium, Netherlands and the UK. And basically we took uh, a weighted average um, costings on these. Um, but, but we find that sort of farming at the moment is very heavily uh, subsidy dependent in the European Union. Most farmers will know that. Um, in fact, all farmers will know that. And in fact, um, everybody involved in the whole sector will know that. But the, the reality is that there's a huge opportunity in terms of carbon farming, because if we can sort out the issue of additionality and subsidies and the various different types of payments, um, in fact, it could be quite lucrative. It could actually mean that um, carbon farming on peatlands could become the most lucrative type of farming on peatlands. Um, you know, and, and that is going to be attractive for farmers. And we feel that that's quite important because they can, you know, it's a win-win situation where farmers will be doing a very good ecological service, uh, working very hard at it and getting paid very well for it. So, um, you know, with, with uh, sort of, you know, getting the subsidies sorted out is something that we feel is, is quite important because what, can't re what we can't really see is a situation where subsidies are kind of skewing um, the land use market, as it were, for, for peatlands. Um, so, right, the conclusions really to our report, and it is, we're launching it officially today, um, we, we, we concluded that current systems do not effectively support sustainable farming. Um, examples uh, show that the sale of peatland carbon credits is definitely feasible. International standards at the moment are too expensive for small peatland projects, so um, we need easy and cheap accreditation systems, and that's something that's absolutely vital. Um, and from a country's point of view, we need to make this easy for farmers. We need to make this easy for landowners. Um, so we need an integrated framework for carbon credits and ecosystem services. That's vitally important. And the provision of subsidies for peatland restoration and maintenance, we feel, is required um, in order to sort of equalize the situation with existing farm, farming methods and other types of land use. So I'm delighted to have done this work with the with the Care Peat project and the uh, carbon in conjunction with the Carbon Connects project. We had some great brains behind us. There are many people involved in this white paper, and I'd like to thank any, each and every one of them. Um, we'd like to officially launch this white paper today here, and I'd like to give the final word to Valentina Secchi, who um, has. It's been a fantastic pleasure to work with you, Valentina. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for the kind word. And of course, it's the same for me. Great pleasure to work with you and for uh, having the opportunity to uh, get experience with that and, uh, and um, arrive to find this final work. And uh, I would like to thank you, all the audience, for listening. And I invite also the audience to look at the white paper. And we would uh, both be happy to hear from you and, and hear your feedback uh, on, on our work. So thank you again. and. Um, now we are ready for answering your question. 
So there you go. And actually, it will be Neil who will be uh, ready to answer any questions you may have, because so much, I mean, if I was listening, I would have a lot of questions. I think very interesting from, you know, what he said, clearly sorting the subsidies aspects, sorting the additionality aspects, making sure that there's an integrated framework for carbon credits and ecosystem services. Super important, but um, a huge wealth of work there. And as you can see, very compelling case for how it could work for you. So if you have a question to ask Neil, he is coming at the end. So please keep it super short and stick it in the Q&A. Now we're going to hear from another farmer now, another Irish farmer, and we're going to continue on that whole theme of financial incentives. So can I please ask the lovely uh, technical crew if they could launch the next video, please? Thank you. I am a full-time farmer and I, my address or my homeland here is uh, in Donegal, uh, about 10 miles outside of Letterkenny um, towards Glenville National Park. I am a sheep farmer. I keep uh, 100 and, about 125 uh, crossbred ewes. Probably 60% of uh, my land would be peatland. Some years ago, uh, I would have done a small amount of commercial turf cutting and to help that uh, there was drains open every so often on the on the land uh, to help drain away water or to make it that little bit drier for for turf cutting during the summer months. I joined the Pearl Muscle uh, program two years ago and one of the things that they would would like me to have done was to do drain blocking and I did do that and it has uh, it has re-wetted a lot of the land that was what well, was dry and um, the, the, now the, the surface vegetation is coming back very well on it remarkably well actually since I joined the Pearl Mussel program uh, I've been getting financial support for that peatland um, the, the more they they have a scoring system, the the more that I'm prepared to do to restore the peatland, the the, the more uh, my payment increases, which okay, is um, very welcome from my point of view and very welcome from the aspect of improving the peatland. When I was first approached by uh, the, the the Derek. Um, or by Pat, Dr. Patrick Russell, I was concerned about the, the re-wetting that it, that it might turn the land back into somewhat of a, uh, you know, a real marsh area. That hasn't happened. Um, uh, I've, I have found no downside as such to um, re-wetting the land. And now that I understand uh, about the, the carbon and all that is stored in the pit. I'm actually pleased to be able to do a little to help um, improve the quality of that land now. And of course, there we heard directly from the farmer. And as uh, Ame had been talking about in the pilot project itself, it's a scoring system. So as he said, the more the more I do, the more I put in, the more I'm compensated for it. And if you want to find out more about that particular project, don't forget that Ame will also be live uh, in the Q&A that's coming in about 15 minutes. Before that, we have one final presentation from, uh, from an expert speaker, an environmental engineer, and we have two short clips from two other farmers, one in France and one in the UK, before we are gonna round off by uh, me inviting most of the expert speakers to join me right at the end. So who is this next speaker? Her name is Véronique Chauvin. She's an environmental engineer. She works in the regional chamber of agriculture of the Pays de la Loire, 
on agri-environmental measures, agroecological transition, and the integration of trees into agricultural systems. Now, she is going to share her evidence-based insights in something very specific, extensive grazing in fens. She presents in French. The accompanying slides are in English. So may I ask our lovely technical team to please launch her video. Thank you. Bonsoir. Je vais vous parler de pâturage extensif dans les fourvières de marais et plus particulièrement euh, du carbone, une clé pour le maintien de l'élevage dans les tourbières de marais. Les tourbières ont été utilisées pour le pâturage extensif pendant plusieurs millénaires. L'intensité du pâturage était déterminée par la qualité de la tourbière et sa localisation. Les pratiques pastorales ont évolué depuis lors et évolue encore grâce à l'amélioration des connaissances naturalistes, zootechniques et autres. Selon la manière dont il est mis en œuvre et géré, le pâturage peut être un outil essentiel pour maintenir voire renforcer la biodiversité des tourbières et optimiser le stockage carbone. Le maintien d'un élevage extensif est donc un enjeu territorial et environnemental essentiel. En déclin depuis 20 ans, l'élevage reste l'une des, des principales activités de production de ces territoires, tout en maintenant les prairies de marais. L'enjeu majeur est de trouver un équilibre entre la préservation des tourbières dans leur fonctionnement écologique notamment en ce qui concerne l'atténuation au changement climatique et la protection des moyens de subsistance des agriculteurs et des propriétaires fonciers. En France, la mise en culture et le retournement des tourbières sont interdits par la loi. C'est la loi sur l'eau et la loi paysage. De sorte que la fauche et le pâturage sont les principaux modes de gestion de ces milieux sensibles. Les études menées depuis une dizaine d'années montrent que les considérations environnementales prennent en compte l'importance du bétail sur l'intensité de l'engorgement et donc sur le déterminisme et la répartition en mosaïque de la végétation et des formes du sol, et ainsi le développement des espèces ligneuses et autres qui menacent l'intensité d'engorgement et donc la génération de la tour ainsi que la contribution de la lumière atteignant le sol ou l'évapotranspiration, le déstockage du carbone. Ceci met en évidence le fait qu'un pâturage bien géré est nécessaire pour la conservation, la diversité et la distribution des milieux dans les sites étudiés et leur fonctionnement, y compris concernant le stockage carbone. Sur cela s'applique un modèle économique. Ce modèle économique est largement appliqué dans les tourbières d'Irlande et de, du Royaume-Uni, où le pâturage traditionnel des moutons fait partie des moyens de subsistance des populations depuis des siècles. Ce modèle économique est également adapté aux tourbières actuellement fortement drainées et ou aux terres que les agriculteurs et d'autres parties prenantes ne veulent pas retirer de la production en raison d'inondations. Sur ces terres, un grand pas vers la réduction du carbone est possible en élevant le niveau des eaux souterraines, mais en maintenant des niveaux d'eau acceptables pour l'élevage. En étudiant la densité de peuplement, il est important de trouver un développement entre la pression un équilibre entre la pression de pâturage et le degré d'ouverture du milieu. Les études menées dans le cadre de Carbon Connect ont permis de créer une boîte à outils où nous analysons les facteurs selon trois guides. Le cadre de décision pour le pâturage du bétail, un guide des meilleures pratiques de pâturage et les recommandations de suivi et d'évaluation pour soutenir une gestion adaptative de ce bétail. Notre site d'expérimentation, site pilote, se situe au niveau du lac de Grandlieu, au sud de Nantes, en France. Il nous a permis 
de suivre et de mesurer les différentes composantes de la faisabilité de ce modèle, de ce modèle économique. Le pâturage tournant ne peut pas se réaliser sous toutes les conditions. Les pratiques agricoles correspondent à des activités de pâturage et de fauche sans utilisation d'intrants. Les parcelles sont exploitées de manière traditionnelle, ce qui permet de maintenir une activité socio-économique et d'entretenir un milieu naturel exceptionnel. Le pâturage tournant dynamique débute début juin pour une période de 4 à 5 mois en fonction des niveaux d'eau, avec une rotation suivant des paddocks, ce qui permet de préserver également les sols et la mosaïque des milieux et de végétation. Ce pâturage permet également de limiter l'expansion des espèces invasives. Le site de Grandlieu est fortement soumis aux variations des niveaux d'eau tout le long de l'année. C'est une réelle contrainte pour l'agriculture. Il faut donc trouver des opportunités de marché et un intérêt pour maintenir l'agriculture sur ce site. Pour les agriculteurs qui élèvent du bétail, la production de produits tels que la viande et le lait, ainsi que les aliments pour animaux comme le foin ou l'ensilage, sont des moyens possibles de créer de la valeur à partir de ces terres. La création de nouveaux canaux de commercialisation, par exemple en établissant du commerce direct entre les consommateurs et les éleveurs, est une option pour permettre de diminuer les intermédiaires, mieux gérer les terres et augmenter aussi les prix qui reviennent aux agriculteurs. Reconnaître les pratiques mises en œuvre sur ces territoires est également un enjeu environnemental. La gestion des tourbières humides se fait grâce à des subventions ou par la vente de crédits carbone, qui est une option afin de permettre une rémunération intéressante et des revenus agricoles stables sur les exploitations, malgré les contraintes environnementales. Le grand avantage de ce modèle commercial, c'est qu'il n'est pas nécessaire de s'adapter ou de changer de système. Ils pourront toujours continuer à produire de la viande ou du lait ou du fourrage sur ces terres, comme ils le font aujourd'hui. Mais en ayant une gestion adaptée et respectueuse, le leitmotiv de cette exploitation est toujours d'essayer de faire mieux en valorisant ces zones. Les éleveurs sont également tournés vers l'avenir avec le changement climatique qui se profile. Il faut qu'ils s'adaptent pour mieux maintenir et aider leur production. En identifiant les niveaux d'eau maximum permettant l'élevage du bétail et la production de foin, ainsi que les niveaux d'eau requis pour la réduction du carbone, on obtient une gestion efficace du site. On tient compte ainsi du stockage carbone optimal et du stockage carbone réaliste dans des conditions économiques satisfaisantes. Toutefois, il est nécessaire qu'il y ait un soutien scientifique et économique des agriculteurs et un suivi régulier du site et des niveaux d'eau et de travailler en partenariat avec les différents acteurs du site pour pouvoir promouvoir ces activités. En fonction de la quantité de travail supplémentaire que cela représente, mais aussi des services écosystémiques supplémentaires rendus et fournis par l'agriculteur, la question est de savoir aujourd'hui quelles sont les modalités de développement de ce crédit carbone. Je vous remercie. Bonne soirée à tous.
And a warm thanks there to Veronique. Veronique will be back um, in about, oh, it'll be about six minutes when we'll be able to kick off the Q&A. Please, please, please don't go away because I can see that there are some questions coming in, some of which may have been answered already, but which uh, you can have more detailed answers live from the speakers. We have two more farmers who've been involved in the project to address you. Now, the first is involved in that very project that Veronique uh, laid out there in France. His name is Michel Coudriot, and he's going to talk about extensive grazing in Lac Grand Lieu. So uh, if we could have the video, please. That's the penultimate uh, testimony from a farmer. Uh, we have one more, and then of course we have our Q&A. So if you can launch Michel's testimony, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Je m'appelle Michel Coudrio, je suis un éleveur laitier. On a 300 hectares de terre dans 110 de marais. Puis un cheptel de 180 vaches et 400 animaux en tout. On a 66 hectares de pâturage qui sont exploités à partir du début mai jusqu'à la fin novembre. Sur ces parcelles-là, on met des génisses et des vaches taries. Sur les parcelles fauchées, il y en a 44 en tout. Elles sont fauchées à partir du 14 juillet. Grand lieu, c'est un milieu naturel qui reçoit les eaux de d'un bassin versant, quand on l'air, donc... Euh, et puis avec la, la pluie, le beau temps, bah, la première difficulté d'exploiter une tourbière, c'est le climat, quoi. Après, c'est rajouté, depuis une dizaine d'années, euh, le problème des espèces envahissantes, quoi, euh, soit des écrevisses, euh, de la jussie, enfin des... Disons, on a des espèces animales envahissantes et des espèces végétales envahissantes, quoi. On a créé, il y a trois ans, une mesure agro-environnementale spéciale jussie, si on veut, quoi. L'objectif, c'est le, le maintien du pâturage en gardant une bande non fauchée pour éviter que la jussie se propage et en même temps essayer de faire du pâturage précoce. Parce que l'herbe pousse avant la jussie. Donc si on peut faire du pâturage précoce, ça permet de maîtriser la jussie, quoi. Mais ça, ça peut se faire que, quand, que si on n'a pas d'eau au printemps, quoi. Sur ces parcelles-là, ce sont quand même des grandes frayères. C'est plein de choses. Hein. Aujourd'hui, j'ai des, des vaches l'hiver, j'ai de l'eau comme ça. Bon, mais ça, c'est tout à fait naturel et compagnie. Ça, ça, c'est un marais qui se couvre 3-4 mois de l'année. Mais si on n'a pas d'élevage, on va dire, le milieu va se refermer. Les roseaux, les saules, tout ça vont prendre la place et compagnie. Et ça sera plus attractif pour les oiseaux. Quoi. Parce que l'hiver, vous venez et, euh, au printemps, on a compté jusqu'à 15 000 à peu près lignicoles en, en même temps sur les marais à une certaine saison. Si on n'a pas l'élevage, ben, tout ça, ça n'existera plus demain. C'est dommage. En tant qu'éleveur, j'ai souhaité que Grandlieu participe à Carbon Connect. Disons que j'avais deux, deux raisons principales. Enfin, la, la première raison, c'était de savoir ce que représentaient nos tourbières enfin, en, en matière de captage de carbone. C'était mon objectif pour, euh, pour pouvoir, on va dire, euh, ben, permettre le, le maintien de l'élevage. Enfin, si, si on travaillait bien, ben, ça pouvait euh, inciter, je dirais, l'ensemble des acteurs à pouvoir maintenir euh, cette pratique d'élevage qui est très importante au point de vue environnemental autrement. Quoi. Et puis, euh, ben, de, savoir, euh, ce qui, euh, de savoir le travail qu'on fait, ben, pour un éleveur, c'est très intéressant. Quoi. Ça, on ne l'avait pas. Bon, on l'apprend un petit peu aujourd'hui, on le connaît un petit peu aujourd'hui, on le saura encore un peu plus demain. Et puis et après, ben, pourquoi s'en servir pour, euh, pour améliorer nos pratiques, pour euh, euh, bénéficier d'aide, pour, euh, pour tout maintenir cette activité-là, qui est très importante pour le milieu. Quoi. Thank you very much to Michelle there. And can I just give, um, I know that our speakers, you can see that questions coming in. I know Neil, you want to answer one live. Jasper's in the process of writing an answer or perhaps already has done so. Veronique, there's a couple of questions in there for you. So please do take a look so we can crack on straight away after this last testimony into that live Q&A. Now, rounding off our farmer contributions is uh, Jimmy Stobart. He helps to manage a three-generation family farm in Cumbria, UK, and he's going to share his experience of managing peatlands, his ambitions for carbon farming and the rewards that can go with it. So may I invite our lovely technical team to please launch the video. Thank you.
Uh, we're here with Jimmy Stobart of High Hall Farm and we're here to ask the value chain analysis for the Farmer to Farmer Network. Uh, I'd just like to welcome Jimmy, thanks Hi for taking part of this. No problem. And uh, yes, we're just going to go into a bit of general information about the farm, what you get it to. So can you just tell me a bit about yourself? Uh, what you've been up to, how old you are, how you came into farming? Uh, yeah, I'm Jimmy Stobart, I'm 34. Um, I farm um, in partnership with my brother and mum and dad on a family farm. Um, we have third generation here in the Eden Valley, Cumbria. Um, the farm itself is about 780 hectares, um, made up of uh, improved, non improved, and uh, moorland. Um, Heather. You go into sort of the, your management regimes, arable, livestock, that type of thing? Uh, yeah, we're fully, fully, uh, fully livestock farm, uh, no arable. Um, we, we farm um, sheep, beef, um, pigs and uh, a handful of chickens. Um, over the last uh, probably eight or nine years we've changed farming system from a sort of conventional stratified, stratified um, sheep system um, with sheep coming down off the hill and um, crossbreeding them and selling breeding sheep. I run a um, fully rotational, um, rotationally grazing system um, with a lot more cattle and uh, less sheep numbers around. And would you follow any sort of environmental, social standards or schemes, things like that, like red tractor, fair trade? Uh, yes, we are. We are red tracted. Um, we're not organic, but we are moving more towards that direction. You have a large area of sort of peatland, heathland, moorland on your farm, so what sort of size, can you describe how wet it is, its vegetation and, and what it's currently used for? Uh, yeah, so we farm um, about 1200 acres of um, heathland and uh, blanket bog. Um, currently that is managed uh, by the landlord for um, red grouse shooting, um, so we're there farming our sheep around that system. And do you use any machines to maintain that land? Uh, ourselves, it's just a quad bike. Do you think your peatland provides any sort of ecological or economic benefits to the to the local area? Uh, yes, I think it does. We all know um, about um, the um, potential for carbon storage in in peatland, which is. Uh, obviously which is something we really want to look into and get really into as part of this project. Um, I also think in where we are the, in quite a high rainfall area, um, I think there's huge potential for us to store a lot of water there. Perfect world, Nelms comes in, what do you want to see from what, 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 sort, what, what would you love to see support? Well I, I want to see the, the um, capital works, we have a lot of, I, I, want, to, I want to involve a lot more trees. Uh, in our farming system um, through silver pasture or agroforestry or whether that be hedgerows or whatever it is. Um, I want to create wetlands on the farm. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas so I'm hoping there's good support for capital works going forward and I also want to see um, the as we've been for our main focus over the last uh, probably eight or nine years has been in improving soil, soil health um, and trying to build soil and organic matter, I'd really like to see see us rewarded for doing that, as it's, as it is a carbon sink in itself, and also um, potential to uh, infiltrate more water. In your opinion, what would motivate or help farmers wanting to rewet their wetlands? Um, I'm not sure. I think there's a bit of a, a bit of farmers are probably quite um, nervous around it as they're looking from a production point of view, and the, the challenges are touched on earlier with the actual management of livestock and you know um, getting into trouble in, in wet, wet areas which is a real issue um, I think that probably puts a lot of farmers off um, but I think this is where we need to um, work with them and raise awareness of you know the good uh, well the, certainly the public goods that can come from it the carbon storage etc um, so I think I think it's about working with farmers.
So thank you very much there to that last farmer. Now I'm trying to extend by a little bit to the webinar. I'm not sure if it's possible. So let's just crack straight on into question time and invite to join me please on screen, Jasper van Bell, Aimee Tillac, Nial Obrolikon and Veronique Chauvin. Now you've been absolutely fabulous because you've already been answering some of those questions. I thank you so much for your incredibly interesting and informative contributions. Let's have a look. I'm gonna stick my glasses on here because there are some questions. Now, Neil, you said that you could tackle this one that came in. If the peatlands currently used, for example, for dairy farming are re-wetted, where, uh, where does the also needed dairy production move to? Okay, I'm gonna keep it very brief because I know we're short for time. Um, basically, there's about 3% of the agricultural land area in the European Union is actually um, agriculture, sorry, of the agricultural land is actually peatland. So there's still the 97% of organic soils. Now, the reality is there's relatively little dairy farming if you look right across the European Union on peatlands. So the answer is there doesn't have to be a huge movement. But having said that, um, there's many types of farming which are very much unsustainable. So um, on, on sort of, I suppose, standard mineral soils, there should be um, more space in the future to, to move what little dairy farming exists on peatlands to um you know mineral soils which which are much more suitable to be honest for dairy farming so okay. i think that's the answer okay i just want to say because i'm very unclear if in three minutes we're literally going to be thrown off so those lovely that lovely technical team needs to let me know in the chat if we are going to be because then i need to tell everybody all of your questions will be answered the project will answer them it would be a great shame if we can't just stay a little bit longer let me just stick with you neil for a quick answer i think you saw uh, the other one the next steps what are the next steps to developing agricultural schemes to acknowledge the efforts done by farmers, you yourself, Neil, talked about, you know, integrating the ecosystem services like water storage in the carbon credits in a practical way. Uh, what else can you say on that issue? Well, the good news that um, by the end of this year, which isn't very long now, um, the European Commission is going to launch a farming initiative, a carbon farming initiative to reward climate friendly practices. And that's outlined in the farm to fork strategy, um, which they've published. Um, and further to that, um, there, there's also they're also launching a, a framework, um, a regulatory framework for certifying carbon removals to verify authenticity. So they're um, going to, to launch a sort of framework for carbon credit scheme effectively, and that's announced in the Circular Economy Action Plan. So the European Commission is on the job, but also um, you know from the scientific point of view, we're putting a lot of pressure on to um, all the different countries to develop local schemes because it really does have yeah. to be made easy for farmers. It's, yeah. it, there's no point in just sort of telling people, look, this is what you need to do without providing sufficient facilities to do it and making it as simple as possible. Farmers want to farm, they don't want to be filling in lots of forms. That's that's my view. I could be wrong about that. No, no, I, no, I, I think it's tough I've, every time I moderate. No, I, it's not, of course, it's not just your view. Right, um, can I just hear, there's a question for you, Veronique, what are the medium water tables in summer? Uh, there we go. It's just uh, it's just moved. I don't know. I now can't see it. But uh, where did we go? I think you saw the question yourself, Veronique. So can I hand over the floor to you? We're keeping our fingers crossed that we're not all going to get thrown out. So Veronique, go ahead, please. Give a little bit of clarification on that 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 dynamic between you know the the, the grazing and the carbon and and tell us a little bit more about those water levels. Thank you. Oui, le, le niveau d'eau est très variable sur Grandlieu, donc il, peut, il est à plus de 2 mètres en hiver et euh, il est au niveau euh, 20 cm en dessous du, du niveau du sol euh, majoritairement. Il y a des suivis qui sont réalisés donc, euh, euh, sur ce, ce terrain-là. Euh, concernant les, les crédits carbone et le stockage carbone dans les marais, les études sont en cours actuellement, donc je ne peux pas donner euh, de chiffres euh, en direct, donc je suis désolée, puisque euh, nous allons prolonger euh, l'étude Carbon Connect pour rentrer dans le vif du sujet des crédits carbone. Mais le, le niveau d'eau est très variable sur Grandlieu. 
Anything else that I may ask by um, Amy, because you have been doing so much around that um, in terms of, you know, looking at water levels in your particular project. I mean, I know it's a different project. I don't know if you wanted to jump in. I'm hoping we won't get thrown out. My laptop says 21.30. It's a bit like Big Ben at New Year. Maybe we have to wait for the last bong. Uh, anything that Jasper or Amy would like to jump in here, picking up the flavour of the questions. You need to put your hands up to see who might speak first. Am I? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a, I'm on mute. Uh, so there's yeah. always one. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, answer the question that uh, was posed by one of the attendees. He was asking, like, within the framework of Carbon Connects, have you have you been able to make progress on this issue of carbon sequestration and the yeah. good water level? Uh, one of the, uh, in Ireland here, the National Parks and the Wildlife Service, um, the NPWS, have done a lot of large-scale rewetting work on the Irish bogs, uh, which have been drained previously, and their researchers found out that, uh, you know, pro after uh, rewetting or drain blocking, the uh, water tables, <clears throat> it's very difficult to maintain the water tables, but if the water tables are maintained within the top 10 to uh, 20 centimeters or ideally within 10 centimeters from the top peat surface, that kind of is a good water level for encouraging sphagnum growth, uh, regrowth on their re-wetted peatlands. That's what the NPWS have found on a lot of Irish bogs here, which encourage uh, sphagnum regrowth. And if you encourage sphagnum regrowth, then obviously you would encourage carbon sequestration um so that's that's i think the good water level of what uh the question was asked i think if i'm if i'm correct on that thank you very much i mean i don't know i'm just going to i know that jasper this is great this is the great thing about these virtual events it's also tremendously interactive um i know jasper is typing an answer to this question that came in on whether the carbon credit schemes are going to be connected with the ets system and include them into the eu carbon market do you want to stop typing and speak Jasper? <laughs> yes would please be, katrina let bit, me stop that <laughs> yeah, would be a bit faster probably yeah okay. i found um um so, so these these carbon credit schemes, all of them, are all that we're we've been looking at now, and most that we all that we've come across are focused on voluntary uh, crediting systems. Mm -hmm. So that's typically not the ETS system. Um, and I think this is also, if you look at carbon crediting, the ETS would not be uh, that's that's the, the mandatory Kyoto Protocol type of uh, uh, carbon crediting for for uh, the rest of the world. Um, uh, I think it would typically not be the way you want to go because it would just increase the amount of paperwork um, involved, and this is probably one of the weakest spots of of carbon crediting anyway. Neil, you were you were nodding there. Did you want to um, also add something to this? No, I, I, I just have to agree with uh, Jasper. And I mean, if you look at the IPCC rules, in fact, they don't tend to allow, um, I suppose, developed countries to, um, you know, to contribute offsets in, in such a way. So really, it has to come. They have to come under the voluntary scheme. But that, that's fine. It doesn't I don't think, again, farmers care where the which way the money gets to them. Um, you know, or, or who is actually going to pay, whether it be the government or whether it be the, um, you know, private private industry or private organizations. So I think selling them under the voluntary scheme is, is the way to go in Europe, really. Just to, to ask all of you, because I don't want to keep people, uh, you know, too long. We, we are not going to get thrown out. So that's good. I just had a, a question. Um, for you i mean yes but i know that that when we spoke before this event you said i mean there, there are certain messages that we want to get across and one is really critically you know we need your help farmers but farmers need to get paid for their ecosystem services and so part of it and certainly that that i was hearing from neil from from, from jasper was you know partly for farmers also we need you to be part of that solution to sort of have push government um, to change policy so that so that they are paid to support society and also sort of these subsidies for draining peatland that were in the cap are just it, it just doesn't make sense is there anything else you want to add to that Jasper sort of from the point of view of empowering farmers I think, if that's I, the I, best thank word you, 
pretty much said it all, uh, Katrina. Uh, um, very little to add to that. But basically, we 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 need to change uh, and the way we produce our food in 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 the world, and especially in in, in Europe, I guess. Um, and especially when it's produced on peatlands. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that we, we need to do here, in, in, in my opinion, is that we need to pay the farmers to do right and, and to do good stuff for the world and, and make sure that they can earn their living that way. So um, okay. take and out the perverse subsidies and, and put in uh, uh, the subsidies that, that, that well, benefit the good practices and and well we can we can come up with ideas as 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 researchers and 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 developers and all that but but ultimately it it is the farming community that that will have to um, take this over from us and and pick this up and and well indeed i mean i was going to come to you neil anyway because when we spoke before this as far as i remember you said you know katrina there is an initial investment but governments and farming advisory groups really need to kind of get stuck in and take a lead on this and you yourself said to me that there's a, it, this quadruple helix to shape policy but get things implemented is is critical yeah well the quadruple helix just basically means, you know, it's a bit of a highfalutin term, but basically it just means stakeholders. So, you know, we're talking about the community, we're talking about the, I suppose, academia and scientists and so on. Yeah. We're talking about sort of aligning um, policymakers and government and then business, of course, you know, and, and making all those things align. But you're absolutely right, um, Katrina, that that's the, um, you know, it is absolutely crucial, for example, to make life as easy as possible for people to change. Mm -hmm because it's a big risk to, to outlay a whole, you know, money to, to sort of, I suppose, moving from, you know, um, let's say sheep farming um, system to a, a re-wetted um, peatland sort of situation if it's not suitable for the sheep, which in general it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there, if there are large outlays, um, it's, it's very advisable, really, if, the, if Europe or the UK or whoever want to kickstart um, I suppose, rewetted peatland to save carbon very quickly, which is what they've said they want to do. Um, you know, it, it's reasonable that they should cough up a bit of money to help people to change. And then on an ongoing basis, obviously, there, there would be an income on the work that people do. But to, to the actual transition, there is a cost attached to that. And it's reasonable that, um, you know, there would be some sort of grants available to assist in that regard. Thank you very much. And Ame, thank you. Did you want to just say, I mean, I think people can read, there was a question there that you actually answered. Do you want to, before I slowly make a last couple of points and ask to hear from each of you, anything that you wanted to say to the audience that's left of the question that you had answered there, which I, I could see you typing yeah. as Neil was speaking. Yeah. No, one of the questions asked was, are I think viewers used to uh, raise the water levels? But uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think I was talking to Patrick Cruchel, who is the project manager of the Freshwater Pearl Mussel. And they, uh, as I said in my slide, they provide incentives to farmers for rewetting. And farmers themselves are so innovative that they come up with the solutions because they know that they are going, the better the quality of the peatland, um the better the incentives so yeah. they take up on themselves once they know that they are going to be incentivized for what they do they innovate and that's what uh you know and they innovate different kinds of uh, activities which they can do on their field according to the size of their field <clears throat> according to the size of their land and various other local uh, material available to revet their peatland, but they do innovate and there are some good examples of that on the Freshwater Pearl Mussel website. So okay. you might want to have a look. There are a few photographs as well of how farmers have, uh, you know, innovated to, to revet their peatlands. And uh, that's, I think that's what probably I answered. Thank you. And, and also don't forget this brilliant site emissions tool. And we're going to hear more about the toolbox as a whole in the next part of this event in a week's time. But that was really fascinating as well. Yes, Veronique, you've been, look, I would have seen, I would have come to you next anyway, but I see the yellow hand. So let me uh, give you the floor. <laughs> 
Oui, je voulais juste ajouter une dernière chose sur l'implication des entreprises privées pour des systèmes simples de contractualisation pour des paiements en services environnementaux et la prise en compte surtout de tout ce qui est déjà fait et bien fait. Euh, voilà, il n'y a pas que l'additionnalité, il y a aussi reconnaître les bonnes pratiques qui peuvent être déjà en place et c'est important aussi pour, pour impliquer les agriculteurs sur les territoires. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, and one more thing that, that didn't get reset, but I really did pick up. I think it was Jasper who talked about it. He said, listen, we are, you said we, we're in this transition to a bio-based economy. This is kind of the moment to pick up on this. Um, yes, there are new crops. Well, the market's not quite there, but there is huge potential. I think I'm talking about both Neil and Jasper. You both said this. So it really is that moment to sort of to grab on it takes i guess a, a leap of faith a mindset change but more than that there is so much work that's gone on both from a technical and a financial exploration capacity this site emissions tool the toolbox to really help farmers get to grips with this and go for it if that's something that they they can and want to do last word from each of you one sentence please and then i need to uh, uh, just say some parting words and let everybody go Uh, to their brandy or hot chocolate. Um, Ame, do you want to start? Just literally anything. What, what rousing message do you want to leave our audience? See the, the fantastic pilot projects and what do you want to say to farmers or what would be your big ask in general within this stakeholder ecosystem? I think uh, from my little experience of, of working in Ireland and with this Carbon Connects project, um, talking to most of the landowners here, um, they would innovate provided that they are assured or that they know there are some incentives for them to okay. do so. And that's the biggest point. Um, they don't mind innovating or revetting their peatlands unless they know that they are incentivized uh, in a proper way. And that's one of the Uh, that's yeah that's the core message uh, I think absolutely and it was echoed there by one of the first farmers I believe uh, that we heard from something we need to find that balance between nature and farm economics that's absolutely critical um, Neil what uh, what would your I mean I know that you're big on you know getting the policy right that's something mm -hmm. that's very close to your heart at EU level and, and the dimension that it adds but very much at member state level I think setting up a framework for carbon credits at national level that is very important anything else that you want to add as a message yeah, well I, I just say you you wanted a rousing sort of thing and I, I would just say I, I've seen I've seen before this pandemic I suppose literally thousands of children out there marching uh, and, and people in COP26, you know, marching saying, look, we need to do something about the carbon situation. And the reality is peatlands are probably the biggest area of low hanging fruit available in Europe that we can quickly make an enormous dip difference by letting peatlands simply operate as peatlands. And, you know, if, if, if farmers can make quite a bit of money in doing this, I think, why not? You know, so why not go down the carbon credit route? Why not properly subsidize it? Why not properly incentivize farmers to, to take a lead in this area and do something really, really useful for our children and our, for, our, for our society? So, you know, let's, let's get on with it and let's, let's make it into a big project and, and just do it across Europe. Thank you. Like Nike, just do it. Veronique, Jasper, Veronique, let's start with you. We're getting people slowly having to go off and get the rest of their dinner. So a beautifully short outro and you, Jasper, I will then miss the poll and I will close our event. So Veronique, over to you, please. Le... Oui, la dernière remarque, c'est qu'il faut prendre le sujet dans le bon sens. C'est pas maintenir les tourbières pour maintenir l'agriculture, c'est maintenir l'agriculture pour pouvoir maximiser, optimiser les tourbières. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, indeed. Thank you very much. And Jasper, over to you. Well, I fully agree with all that's been said before me. Uh, let's let's take this uh, 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 to the next uh, st levels and steps. And um, we've been trying to to get the tools to build the tools to help uh, the practitioners actually make this transition. Um, please let us know what, what works and Absolutely. what does not work. What else do you need? What have we succeeded yeah. in providing you with? What else do we need to come up with to help you make the change?
Indeed, indeed. So thank you. And I think that echoes what I said that you'd said earlier. We need farmers. That, that's what we need in this. So tell us where the gaps are. So I thank all of you sincerely for letting me be a bad moderator and going over time. I did warn you, uh, we'll skip the poll. I thank you so much to all of our speakers for their incredibly wise words. And to all of those who aren't here, don't forget, you can catch all of those videos on the Carbon Connects YouTube channel likewise this event in a couple of days thank you so much to you our audience for joining us at the end of well a very very long day and to our brilliant interpreters who have helped bring this event to life now if you enjoyed everybody's brilliance and you got something good out of this sparkling more than 90 minutes can you join the sister session it's exactly one week 21st of december uh, 20 hundred to 21 30 cet we are going to present business models Paluda culture and the wonderful and useful toolbox. Okay, so that is an early Christmas present for you. It's not too late to register and you can invite all your friends, your family, your granny, please, who might be interested in this part of the peatlands journey. Um, apart from that, of course, you can follow the project on social media and do tweet. That's critical. I look forward to meeting you all again in one week's time. In the meantime, I wish you very, very well. I thank these lovely speakers with me. We can all wave. I'm going to be going to sleep thinking about the potential of peatlands. And uh, I hope all of you too. And gosh, rudely, I didn't thank the fabulous Carbon Connects team and the brilliant uh, technical team behind the scenes who have made this all possible, including bringing all these wonderful speakers together. Thank you. That's it from me, Katrina Sickle, and all of these wonderful speakers. See you in one week's time.